Okay, without further ado, uh, uh, a few words on the symbology, the symbology that you find on, on the labels, on the three bottles that you have uh, received. The name, first of all, Coldorcha, the place. I'm speaking from Coldorcha, I'm speaking from the, where the vineyards are planted, where the cellar is uh, located, where we um, grow the grapes, where we bottle the wine. Uh, so anything you got uh, in the wooden case uh, with, the, with the bottles, uh, is, uh, is from here, from, uh, from Coldorcha. We, we are a very territorial producer. We've always been, and for us, our name, Coldorcha, the place where we are located is also a mission to produce the best wine that this hill, this part of Montalcino is capable of uh, delivering. And then we have the symbol on which appears on our labels. It's composed of two elements. You have the three rows of hills, very typical of this area of the world. The uh, uh, coat of arms of the municipality of Montalcino has the three rows of hills as well, and many other uh, traditional families from the region. Uh, for us, for here at Cordocia, it represents our link with the land, our, the fact that we are farmers. I always like to say that here at Cordocia, we are not winemakers. We are farmers, we grow grapes, and uh, the wine is a consequence of the grapes we pick. So the, the three rows of hills, the link with the land, uh, the link with Mother Earth is all important to us. And then we have the hand pointing to the star, which is uh, an indication of our search for excellence, our quest for quality in our everyday endeavors. So wine is the fruit of uh, Earth and of the uh, labor of man, and this symbol encapsulates that, uh, that concept. Now we are in a very special area here in Montalcino and where Coldoce is located. We are champions of biodiversity. We have a very special predisposition towards biodiversity. 50% of the land in Montalcino is still today covered with natural woodland, with Mediterranean shrub. And uh, only a small percentage of the, of the land, uh, of the agricultural land is actually dedicated to vines. We have a lot of crops, a lot of different uh, um, crops that we grow on, on this land. So real biodiversity. Not only that, we, uh, we belong to a, a land that's been recognized uh, uh, since the Middle Ages, since the early Renaissance has been governed uh, under good government rules, uh, the, under the principles of a, a father of a family uh, attitude. And it's all, as you can see on this picture, this picture is actually taken from the vineyards, looking into the valley, looking towards the river, the Orchard River, and as you can see, a, a lot of colors, a lot of uh, um, uh, land shaped by the hand of man over the centuries in, uh, in plots of land that are the size of, uh, of, of a person. We are also in a natural park. This is a picture I took outside the cellar in, uh, in, in a snowy day. I, I understand you know a lot about snow these last few days in, in the US. And uh, we are a UNESCO territory, a World Heritage Site. So if you put together all these elements, working here, uh, uh, the fact that we produce honey in Montalcino and here at Cordocia, if you put together all these elements, you, you start feeling, or at least I started feeling, uh, a duty towards protecting this very special environment, uh, a, a duty of uh, protecting what uh, I was uh, lucky enough to, to inherit and that I will leave to the future generations. And that's why 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I decided to transform Coldorcha in a fully organic farm. Uh, we have chosen this four, four and a half century old oak tree, which sits just next to the Brunello di Montalcino Riserva vineyard, the Poggio Vento vineyard, as uh, the symbol of our care for nature the symbol of our care for the environment. And so uh, I'm pleased to show this picture uh, of uh, this monument of nature, this uh, representation of how important the environment is for us. Of course, we, we would seek our, uh, in our everyday work, as I indicated, the hand pointing to the star, uh, quality. And to do that, we have always invested a lot in research and development. 
In fact, we are considered here in Tuscany, Cordorcia is considered a pioneer in research and development. One uh, element we can, we, if you're interested, you can ask questions about the various chapters of research we, we have conducted. But let me mention one which we uh, have been conducting for 30 years. Last year in 2020, we celebrated 30 years of using systematically cover crops in the vineyards at Coldorcha. That makes Coldorcha the uh, longest uh, estate, the estate that has been using cover crops for the, for the longest time. And cover crops have developed over time. They have become a way of fertilizing the vineyard. And these days they, we even consider when we choose the blend of uh, seeds that we, use, that we sow for, for cover crops, the, the fact that the bees will pasture uh, in these fields and the vineyards uh, uh, for the production of honey. So I, as I like to say, we don't uh, grow uh, grapes and just produce wine. We farm biodiversity. We farm protection of the environment. Uh, here at Cordorcia in the last few years, we have uh, put families to live in the old farmhouses scattered on the estate. Um, there are families, young families with children who have interest in, in breeding animals and having their own farm animals and having the orchards, uh, having fruit trees, that uh, uh, rural economy, which is so important to uh, develop and uh, uh, cultivate biodiversity and the right environment for organic uh, uh, agriculture. Kodosh is a historic farm. I'd like to show always this uh, medal from 1978 for a wine made from Sangiovese from the Brunello vineyards. So uh, the ancestor of Rosso di Montalcino, and this is a, a Swiss competition, a Belgian company presenting this, uh, this wine, an indication of the contribution that Coldorcia has given to the uh, notoriety and the distribution of uh, Montalcino wines in Italy, in Europe and around the world. I also pulled out a label from the 1970s uh, that we used to ship to the United States. I don't know if you can, can read at the bottom of the, of the page, it says imported by the Mosswood Wine Company in New York. So this is a, a bottle from the 1970, Brunello di Montalcino, estate bottle. We still produce the same wines today. Also Rossi Montalcino, same, this is from, uh, Vintage 1983, um, the first year of DOC, of Denominazione di Origine Controllata, the first DOC of Rosso e Montalcino, the first vintage of uh, uh, DOC Rosso e Montalcino, and here as well we exported this, this wine to the United States a long time ago. The first Trebicheri, when it was still uh, published by Slow Food, Slow food uh, requires a, a mention on my side. I'm very close to Carlo Petrini and we're very close to that kind of mindset of looking at the future of how we're going to feed the world population, how we're going to um, make sure that we do it in a healthy, sustainable way. Now, I like to think of Montalcino and of Brunello di Montalcino as the fruit of a magic formula. Um, it all started in the middle of the 19th century when Clemente Santi actually discovered that wines made in the very healthy climate and environment of Montalcino, kept in the large oak barrels that you see in this picture, did not turn into vinegar. It actually aged well. It actually developed uh, into a more interesting wine. It actually evolved in a positive way. And what are the elements of this magic formula? Well, of course, Sangiovese to start with, pure Sangiovese, nothing but Sangiovese. Here at Cordorcia, we have conducted clonal selection with the University of Florence on the Sangiovese. And uh, we have created clones which are available to all the producers here on, uh, on the territory. The terroir, the very special soil uh, the, of different kinds. We have clay, we have sandy soil, we have soils from different um, geological eras but they all have a high level of uh, calcium, a high level of limestone. 
and that's the essential element for the quality of Sangiovese. And then the hand of man, in our case, a family that's been producing wine for uh, four centuries. And in this picture, my son, the next generation who will take over the production of wine here at Coldorcia in Montalcino. So we make wines in the vineyard. Uh, I like to reiterate what I said at the beginning. We are farmers, we grow grapes, and uh, the quality we want in our wines has to come from the grapes, has to come from the skins of the grapes we bring to the cellar. We produce handcrafted wines. Um, we are also biodynamic. Uh, since the year 2018, I've introduced biodynamics in, uh, in the vineyard, and uh, we uh, can say with all uh, confidence that every cluster of grapes, every bunch of grapes here at Cordorcia is touched by human hand. Every bottle that leaves our cellar is checked by a person. So we produce handcrafted wine. We are artisans, wine artisans. And we produce traditional wines. We're going to taste them now. Um, and uh, the traditional wine concept for us is not only the methodology of production, but it's also the style of wine. Wines that are made to be paired with food. Wines that are made to sit on the dinner table. So we will taste them now, but I also hope you will then have the opportunity to pair them with some recipe, with some uh, uh, food and see and understand our concept. The concept of drinkability, concept of uh, uh, a wine that will accompany well food. Maybe it won't impact you uh, on the first tasting. It won't uh, uh, sort of surprise you with uh, its uh, incredible intensity to the aroma and the taste at the beginning, but it will accompany very well your, the food you are going to pair with it. So uh, the wines we're going to taste are Brunello di Montalcino vintage. On the screen, you have uh, the um, technical sheet uh, provided by uh, Tau Family Selection. Uh, they have all this material and there's a lot of facts and information on, uh, on the uh, fact sheet of the wine. And uh, what I um, like to uh, stress is the fact that it's a very simple label, a label that says Brunello Montacino, says Coldorcia, and the symbol that uh, we talked about at the beginning. Coldorcia is uh, uh, the uh, producer in Montacino that has the largest collection of old vintages of Brunello Montacino, of all the appellation. We started collecting in the mid 60s when my father arrived here and we have most vintages since that era available here on the, in the cellar. The second wine we would, I would like to taste with you is Brunello di Montalcino Riserva Poggio al Vento. Poggio al Vento, this uh, picture, you can see the vineyards of Poggio al Vento. You can see on the right hand side of the picture the oak tree I was uh, talking about before, the oak tree that uh, you saw covered with snow. Um, and this is uh, a, a sunset picture of, uh, of that area. Um, and here you have this uh, label of uh, Brunello di Montalcino Riserva, where we try to stress what for us is the essence of Brunello. The essence of Brunello, Brunello became famous when wine lovers around the world tasted old bottles of Brunello, tasted old Sangiovese that had a chance to uh, um, develop and mature in the bottle. And that's what we do with this, uh, with this label. We hold it four years in the oak barrels, three years in the bottle before releasing. And then um, at, yet, at that stage, we still feel it can go on aging for quite a while. And, um, Oh, this is a, an article that came out in Italy uh, last year, a year ago, uh, of all the Italian wine guides, all the Italian wine critics, the Brunello di Montalcino that uh, got the greatest number of uh, high scores is the Poggio Vento, Brunello di Montalcino Riserva by Coldorcia. And the third wine I would like to taste with you is what, what is defined by producers here in Montacino as an exotic wine. It's a Cabernet Sauvignon, pure Cabernet Sauvignon, single vineyard, 
a vineyard that my father planted in 1984, first vintage 1989. We have had a lot of satisfaction from this wine and I like to show it because it demonstrates how special Montalcino is, not only for Sangiovese, not only for other grape varieties, for like Cabernet Sauvignon, but in many other crops such as olive oil and tobacco and the grains and honey and so on. So uh, the Olmaya single vineyard Cabernet Sauvignon is an expression of how special Montalcino is. Hospitality, I hope we can talk about hospitality soon again, social media and a simple message. So I try to keep it short, not to bore you and uh, I'm uh, ready for your questions. Yeah, th thank you so much, Count Chanzano. And, you know, you, you touched on the, the team at the winery. Um, everything is touched by hand. Uh, the team works under an agronomist who's been there for 45 years. It's a real true community with families living on the estate. Can you tell us a little bit more about the team and about the families um, that live in the community? Yes, yes, absolutely. The, the agronomist is the, uh, has been here, I think, 47, uh, since 1974, so uh, 46 years now and 47 years. And uh, he's the continuity, the continuity. He has uh, seen uh, all these chapters of research and development we have conducted over the years. Um, he has the um, taste memory of uh, where we have come from and uh, making sure that we have a common thread over time. Um, and then uh, really we started uh, restoring the traditional farmhouses on, on the land. Uh, and these days to, it all started with the search for uh, skill workers uh, and the um, fact that uh, we needed to provide uh, homes for them in order to find the right people to, to work on the state. Uh, and that developed into a community. And uh, I must say this uh, uh, pandemic has uh, strengthened a lot the, the community. In fact, um, we, we had instructions of lockdown of staying within the property and we did stay within the property. We just uh, were a bunch of people. So we had our barbecues, we had uh, uh, we, we felt like in an old medieval castle surrounded by a water ditch and uh, pulling up the, the bridge, you know, the drawbridge and, uh, uh, and feeling safe uh, within, uh, within the boundaries of our, of our walls. So with children, uh, farm animals, dogs, uh, uh, I, I feel very lucky, in fact, uh, of being able to uh, to live in such an environment and to share such an environment. Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely want to dig into a little bit more detail about your relationship with the University of Florence. But first, I think we should jump into the first wine and get tasting here. So uh, perhaps you can take us through the 2016 Brunello di Montalcino. Yes. So Brunello di Montalcino 2016. This is uh, what we call vintage Brunello. The Brunello we produce every year. It's uh, the result of a blend from uh, all the uh, Sangiovese vineyards we have on the state. Um, we undergo a selection, a, what we call a vintage choice. All our Sangiovese vineyards um, are picked in a selective manner and uh, all of them contribute to Rosary Montalcino, contribute to Brunello di Montalcino. Um, uh, and, uh, depending on, on, on the vintage. 2016 was a great vintage, uh, stems from a fairly balanced 2015. Uh, so the vineyard was uh, nice and rested, with, didn't suffer particular stress on the previous year. So it produced a very balanced quantity of grapes uh, from, uh, from the start of the season, from the spring. And uh, then we had, uh, we, we were lucky not to have one of these uh, uh, severe heat waves that uh, is characterizing the, the climate in more recent years and the uh, feature of the, of the climate change of the warming up uh, that, we, that we are seeing. So a balanced uh, season, um, 
which uh, has given us a more traditional kind of Brunello compared with 2015, with, compared with uh, recent vintages. Um, more traditional because it's uh, a little bit tight. I understand uh, Bethany asked you to open these bottles uh, in advance. And uh, so if they have a chance to breathe uh, in with the bottle open and in the glass as well, uh, the aromas should start uh, showing. You have freshness, you have crispness, for us, the protection of the acidity of the grapes is the um, main uh, parameter for uh, picking decisions, for harvest decision. We need to protect the acidity, which is typical of the Sangiovese, because that's what makes the wine drink easy to drink, makes the wine easy to pair with food, and makes the wine uh, capable of lasting a long time. So freshness, fruitiness, uh, crispness to the, to, to the aromas and uh, on the palate uh, are the first uh, characteristic I think you, you will notice. Um, then the, uh, uh, apart from the red fruits typical of the Sangiovese, the red cherry, um, spices from the Mediterranean uh, shrub, so the tra traditional uh, ingredients of the Mediterranean recipes, rosemary and sage and bay leaf and juniper and, and so on. Um, also some flowery elements, some uh, uh, field flowers, uh, I think you call them some. Uh, and uh, the same to, to the taste, uh, reminiscent uh, of, uh, of the Mediterranean uh, woodland. Fantastic. Um, Francesco, we're getting a couple of questions here surrounding the, the hot topic of the year, COVID. Um, the, the first question came from Andy Harris. He's curious about the current COVID situation in Tuscany right now. What are the restrictions? How freely can you move about these days? Well, in, um, in Montalcino itself, um, they have closed high school. Uh, there are two high schools in Montalcino. They, they're closed since yesterday. Um, the real uh, source of uh, con contagion these, these days is not only here, but uh, in most of Italy through schools and the younger generations, uh, they need to go to school. They've been kept out of school too long, uh, but that also means uh, it's, it's a source of, um, of worry and of, uh, uh, of contagion. Uh, we, we've been lucky in a rural area such as this one. We have been, it's been easier than in other places to, uh, to keep safe, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we feel yeah. the, uh, the circle closing around us, but we'll, uh, we'll defend ourselves. <laughs> And, um, and Dave McIntyre asks, um, in relation to the future market for a wine like Brunello de Montalcino, how do you see COVID and the aftermath of that impacting the market for Brunello? Well, we, I don't want to sound too, too positive, but uh, we've, had, we had, we've had a good year. We've had uh, um, good demand. We, I feel that the uh, world, Cordocia gets in the hands of consumers, gets tasted by consumers. Uh, we, are, we usually see, see them coming back, asking for more. Um, it's uh, Brunello di Montalcino is among those, those wines that uh, uh, I believe uh, people are uh, asking for to when, when they want a treat. I think that in many cases, with the pandemic and with the difficult situation, you get to a point that uh, uh, certain days, uh, certain evenings, certain weekends, um, you want to treat yourself and uh, Brunello is there for that. Absolutely. Uh, what are your largest export markets for Cordorcia? Uh, the largest export market for Cordorcia and for Brunello is uh, Sweden, mm -hmm. where there is a monopoly uh, that when I say con when consumers uh, have a chance to decide what uh, uh, 
uh, what they can uh, bring home. Um, Kodocha has a good chance. Um, second market is obviously the, the US, but we're present in more than 70 countries around the world. And that's one of the strengths of, uh, of Kodorcha, of uh, even in a situation as, such as the one we've lived through in the last year, you have some markets that uh, decline, some markets that grow. Uh, and at the end of the day, we, we managed to ship uh, the, the wine we have, uh, we have produced, we have bottled. Great. Um, and we have a question um, from Fred concerning soil. You had mentioned that limestone is essential. Um, how does the limestone impact Sangiovese in particular? Well, the, the limestone, the calcare, as we call it, um, is readily available in the soils in Montalcino. We have, uh, in some cases, even quite high pHs. We have uh, a pH around uh, seven and a half um, as an indication of the um, presence of calcium, easily absorbable. The, um, the area where we have the highest amount of uh, easily absorbable uh, limestone is the Poggio Vento vineyard. Uh, the Poggio Vento soil is uh, different from the rest of the estate, where you have a majority of clay. On the other hand, the Poggio Vento has uh, a mostly sandy soil. Um, and the, uh, the limestone that's available in the sandy soil, which is from a very old geological era, from when this part of the world was under seawater to a former seabed, um, is, uh, is the feature of, uh, that makes the difference for the grapes of, uh, of the Poggio Vento. Um, so the, uh, the, the limestone defines the, the quality of the tannins um, and uh, precisely the, the fine tannins that you find in the Poggio Vento, the second wine we're tasting this evening, uh, are the, the fruit of this uh, uh, highly available limestone which I think makes a perfect segue to wine number two. We do have quite a few questions about your organic and biodynamic activities, which we'll go back to, but first let's, uh, let's move into the Poggio Alvento 2013. So Poggio Alvento Brunello di Montacino Riserva, uh, on the hill, the hill overlooking the Orchard River, we have um, a ridge, the one I was just talking about, where there's a special soil that comes to the surface, a more sandy soil. It goes from, uh, 250 to 350 meters over sea level. Uh, it's uh, the name itself, Poggio al Vento, means windy height. Coldorcha, the Coldorcha Hill is one of the closest to the Mediterranean uh, coast and one of the areas of Montalcino most influenced by sea winds. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, we always have uh, a bit of a breeze on the Poggio al Vento vineyard and the translation of Poggio Vento is windy height. Um, so this special soil, we have, uh, it's a reasonably large area, about seven hectares, and we select some grapes from this area, from these seven hectares every year, uh, or rather in the best years, uh, to produce this reserva. It's a limited uh, amount of bottles. Uh, what we are tasting now is vintage 2013, it was a very small vintage. We produced only about 12,000 bottles of this, uh, of this vintage. Uh, and uh, we had, did not produce 2014, for instance. We produce it uh, in general, on average, five years out of 10. Only the best vintages, only the ones that guarantee a longevity of the wine over time. So, um, Poggio Alvento is, uh, Really, as I was saying at the, earlier on, uh, it wants to represent the essence of the Brunello Montalcino, the capacity to age. Fantastic. And the, the quantity of the 2013 vintage was rather small, as you mentioned. And I understand this was due to weather conditions in 2012. That's right. 2012 was a very difficult season. We have the coming together of the great um, heat wave and drought. So the two phenomenons that characterize the climatic change uh, for us, they came together in 2012 that uh, caused a massive stress to the vineyard. 
So 2013, the plants produced really a very small amount of fruit. And that's why uh, we, uh, we picked uh, only, we uh, were able to produce only about 12,000 bottles. The, on, however, even though it, the amount of fruit was uh, very small, it was a very balanced season. Uh, so we, we are happy with the elegance, the finesse, the slenderness of, uh, of this wine that will uh, show better and better over time uh, as the um, uh, evolution in the bottle takes place. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous now. What would you say would be your projection in terms of longevity and development for the Poggio Avento? Well, I think that uh, the next 10 years are going to uh, really show a constant uh, improvement, evolution, gaining complexity, um, uh, softness of tannins, uh, even greater softness of, ta softness of tannins stepping in. Um, so something to discover from now onwards. Absolutely. Um, a, a bit of a technical question here um, from David Spector. He's asking if high acid wines in Montalcino ever struggle with malolactic fermentation. And not really, no, no. We uh, well, you need the right conditions. We uh, we we do uh, alcoholic fermentation in stainless steel. But then we have a number, a fair number of concrete tanks, uh, which have the characteristic of uh, holding the temperature better in a natural way. And so uh, after alcoholic fermentation, we move the wines into, uh, into concrete tanks. Uh, and there we uh, naturally in, inoculate with, uh, with the leaves from, uh, from a wine that has uh, already done malolactic. And, uh, keeping the temperature constant, malolactic fermentation is uh, not a problem. Obviously, uh, regions throughout the world are contending with climate change. Have you seen impacts in the past decade in Montalcino and what are those impacts um, as they result in the most recent vintages? Yes, yes, well, Really, since the year 2000, uh, we, we have started, we, we didn't know that it was climatic change, but uh, now looking back, uh, we understand that, uh, yes, the last 20 years have, uh, have seen. The first great variety to indicate that uh, things were changing was Moscatello di Montalcino, the wine Moscato grape, the traditional mid Middle Ages wine uh, grape that uh, is grown here in Montalcino. With, uh, with Sangiovese, we started seeing the um, uh, picking dates, the harvest uh, dates uh, earlier and earlier. Um, in 2017, we even started, into, sorry, in 2012, we even started uh, in the last days of August uh, to, to pick the grape, which was un unheard of. And um, these days we, we are, Looking very carefully, the main uh, issue we have to face is dehydration, is great heat wave day and night for day after day, sometimes uh, uh, for <clears throat> two or three weeks uh, uh, without interruption. Uh, of course, the wind that helps to, uh, to dry uh, and, um, and maybe some drought as well. And there you have the uh, over ripening of the grapes, which is something we absolutely want to avoid. Um, and uh, the shooting up of the alcohol level. Uh, so these are the problems we, we are, we're facing now. We're looking at uh, uh, defoliation, uh, uh, management of the canopy. Um, we're looking at different solutions to, to try and, uh, and manage this, uh, this situation. Great, thank you. Uh, a question from Mary Ewing Mulligan. She's perceiving the 2016 to be more muscular than the 2013. How much of this is a result of the specific vintage or a function of the greater age on the 2013 or to, to the point perhaps a function of the site? Yes, mostly the different vintage. 
mostly definitely the different vintage. 2000, 2013 um, is one of those uh, vintages in Montalcino that uh, will, uh, will show better and better over time uh, because it's the, the elegance element is more important than the structural element. Mm -hmm. um, I always like to think of the um, Brunello vintages, the different Brunello vintages. Um, if you sort of had to draw a graph, uh, on one side you would have elegance, slenderness. On the other one, you would have uh, you have um, a structure and uh, intensity and uh, and depth. Um, so, two thousand and thirteen. Roger Vento will certainly sit on, 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 on the uh, elegant side uh, and 16 is more on the structural side on the um, more, more powerful. So mostly a result of the climate of the season of the different seasons. Great, thank you. Um, and we're getting lots of fabulous comments on both of the wines, which you can uh, read through later. I won't, I won't read them all out, but um, we did have a comment from Michael Epstein who tasted the 2013 Poggio Vento a year ago um, and is now tasting it again and feels like while still youthful, it is definitely showing some evolution. Is that typical for this particular wine with one additional year of bottle age? So, sorry, the question. So the question is um, the 2013 Poggio Vento, Michael tasted it one year ago and, yes. and today feels much more evolved. Is that typical for a wine to change so much um, with one additional year in bottle when it comes to Poggio Alvento? Yes, yes, yes and no, in fact, <laughs> I, I must say. Um, 2013 is, uh, has, has evolved a lot in the last year. Uh, Michael is absolutely right to say so. Um, it's uh, it's settling down, I would say, uh, because it's it it has evolved, but it's uh, it's not showing any uh, any sign of being tired or anything like that. Um, so it's it's something we we are watching ourselves uh, as well. Um, every vintage of Brunelli Montalcino reserves surprises. You have the vintage that will start showing uh, all its potential. Uh, after a number of years, and I would say 2016 is one of those. Uh, and you have uh, other vintages that uh, in the early years will evolve more rapidly and then uh, reach uh, a, a, a right balance, uh, a right point of harmony and hover there without further evolution. Uh, so yes, 2013 has, uh, has changed a lot since we tasted it. Uh, him and I together last year. Great, thank you. Um, before we move on to the Olmaya, I just wanted to address some of the questions that are coming in about your early pioneering of organic viticulture and truly organic farming in Montalcino and in, in Tuscany overall. Can you talk a little bit about what your early motivation was to get into organic farming? And then as a part two to that question, have you seen an impact on the style of the wines as a result? Well, the, the reason we decided to go organic, uh, to take the organic certification uh, was realizing that uh, there was very little to be done, in fact, to, to, uh, to do so. Uh, we realized many years ago and uh, Certainly, uh, the cover crops and the vineyards, the management of uh, the vineyards through cover crops is uh, uh, one of the examples of this, that uh, quality is a result of uh, um, a balance, a balanced fruit of uh, harmonious management of the, of the vineyard. If you ask too much fruit of the vineyard, you will weaken the plant, you will weaken the, uh, uh, the, the environment and uh, it will become more prone to uh, pests or disease. If you allow the, the plants to produce just what they're capable of, uh, of producing um, in, a, in a balanced environment, then that's when you uh, obtain the maximum quality and, and, and the best results uh, uh, overall because uh, you, all the fruit is healthy, everything is, uh, 
uh, of first choice and you don't um, you don't have to discard anything so um, we have never over the years ever since the 70s used extensively uh, chemical products at Cordotta. so we we really realized that the the most difficult part was not to change practices in the vineyard to certify it organic, but was to change the mindset of people. Uh, we, we have been educated, uh, certainly here in Italy, in a very Cartesian way. We expect a reaction to any action. Um, and it's not so in, uh, in organic, uh, and even less so in, uh, biodyna with biodynamic practices. Um, so accepting that uh, uh, you have to use a homeopathic approach, uh, uh, you have to uh, look at a, a holistic concept of, uh, of management uh, uh, has been the, the greatest uh, challenge to, uh, to become fully organic. To, uh, I, I like to think that uh, to produce a good wine, you need uh, a happy winemaker. It's a question of vibes. Vibes have their importance, uh, uh, even and especially in the production of a natural product of a biological process such as wine. Fantastic. I think if I was to be stranded somewhere, I'd want it to be the Coldorcha estate because in addition to all the fantastic wines that you're making, you've got, uh, you're growing your own tobacco for handmade cigars, you're, 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 you have a bee population that's producing beautiful honey, uh, you're making pasta from, uh, from grains growing right there on the estate, ancient grains, if I'm, if I'm correct. So it's amazing to see all of the beautiful aspects that go into the organic farm that is called Orcha. Yes, well, it, it's, it's, it's just Looking at the history, at the rich agricultural history of uh, Montalcino, Montalcino was a very isolated uh, um, area in uh, in Tuscany, and uh, uh, the, the ancient farms. You used to people that lived on on ancient farms. They used to survive on what the land produced, and was you used to grow what they needed to survive. And this is somewhat the the concept we were trying to apply. We we have our animals, we, we breed our sheep and our goats and, uh, and we have our poultry and uh, I just released a few, a few pheasants uh, uh, last week uh, to, uh, to, to nest in the vineyards, in fact. And uh, it, it gives you so much satisfaction, so much pleasure when you're walking through a vineyard and you find a, a nest of, uh, of pheasants with the eggs in the in the nest or, you know, or uh, small, um, pleasures, small pleasures. We're all curious, do you have any open houses on the estate? Because um, we may be coming over en masse. <laughs> Your community <laughs> might, might be about to get a lot bigger. Um, great, thank you, Francesco. Um, perhaps we can move into the final wine, Olmaya, just to kind of stay on schedule here and pivot to Cabernet. Yes, Olmaya. I will also often ask the, the meaning of the name Olmaya. Uh, in Italian, Olmo is an elm tree. So Olmaya is a wood of elm trees. You know, elm trees have disappeared in Europe uh, after the Second World War due to uh, disease. And uh, so when we were clearing the land for, for planting this Cabernet Sauvignon, one, one day the uh, workers came came home saying they had found an old Maya so young elm trees sprouting from uh, from old roots uh, coming coming back and that's uh, that gave the name to the to the vineyard and uh, eventually to the wine in uh, in the early 80s when my father was uh, here in Montalcino it was very difficult to sell wines from Tuscany expensive wine from Tuscany were were well, not very well known, not even in Italy, not even in Northern Italy. So it was difficult to, to sell uh, uh, wines from, um, important wines from, uh, from Tuscany. That's why he tried different grape varieties among which Cabernet Sauvignon. And um, from the first harvest, 1989, this Cabernet Sauvignon has given us incredible satisfaction, has, uh, uh, really uh, 
provided the world with a um, special view on Montalcino. What you find in the glass of Olmaya 2015, the one I, I sent you as a sample, is very typical Cabernet Sauvignon, all the elements uh, characteristic of the variety, and then the Tuscan, the Montalcino climate and soil behind it. So you have the, the dark fruit, you have the typical elements uh, of a ripe, yet not overripe Cabernet Sauvignon, and then the the herbs and spices, the uh, intensity of the hot climate of the summer here in Montalcino. Fantastic. Um, there's a question about um, other varieties planted on, on the estate that are international. Are there any other Bordeaux varieties that you've planted or non-Bordeaux varieties for that matter? I know you have some Pinot Grigio planted there as well. Yes, we produce uh, <clears throat> some three white wines. We produce a Pinot Grigio, uh, with the intensity of the hot climate we have here, we produce a Vermentino, a Vermentino which is very fresh, young, fruity, easy to drink. Uh, all again thought for pairing with with food, pairing with the fish from the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. and a Chardonnay, a barrel fermented Chardonnay, which was planted at the time of the Olmaya of the Cabernet Sauvignon. So one of the very first. Uh, non-Italian, non-Tuscan grape varieties we planted here. Now we have, uh, these days we have Syrah and uh, Merlot and uh, Petit Verdot that all go into um, a blend called Nearco. So uh, uh, very, like to think of it as a cosmopolitan blend. <laughs> and then we, out of the production of uh, Brunello Riserva, Brunello uh, Rosso di Montalcino, we have uh, balances of Sangiovese that we blend with uh, Chile Giolo, which is a traditional grape variety from this part of, uh, of Montalcino, this part of Tuscany. Uh, and we produce a very young, uh, only stainless steel, uh, fresh, fruity, everyday wine called Spezieri. And then we, Montalcino, not everybody knows that Montalcino is uh, part of the DOCG Chianti. So we produce some Chianti as well, uh, and we use uh, the uh, international grape varieties that do not, the Cabernet that does not rate for Romaya or does not rate for Niarco, the other blend I was talking about, for the, for the Chianti. Uh, and, and of course, very important, the one I always like to remember, Moscadello di Montalcino, the wine that dates back to the Middle Ages and uh, I hope we have a chance one day to talk about Moscadero di Montalcino. But just think of this, everywhere in Tuscany, the wines of the uh, tradition of religious services for use for religious services is a wine made with Trebbiano grape. It's a, it's a Vinsanto. Only in Montalcino, since the Middle Ages, since the early Middle Ages, Moscato Bianco is used and the uh, Moscadello di Montalcino wine. Another indication of how special Montalcino is, and this is for the next chapter, the next time we, we meet together. Part two, great. Um, Francesco, there's a lot of great comments coming in about the Cabernet, but I'm just gonna have to uh, read Ziggy's because it, it just made me smile. Um, she says that the Cabernet is sexy, stunning, salubrious, sassy, and seductive. So I, I'll, I'll agree with that one. Um, you know, and, and on the more serious side, Deborah had a comment about um, the fact that it's just showing so much varietal typicity, which is wonderful to see. And she's getting a distinct mineral note on this wine as well. Um, do you perceive that too? And, and how would you uh, describe it personally? Yes, yes. The Olmaya vineyard uh, is um, very close, bound, uh, uh, it's um, uh, it has a boundary with uh, Poggio Vento, so it's this uh, sandy soil we were talking about before, this mm -hmm. um, very readily absorbable limestone, uh, which uh, gives, uh, gives the minerality to, to, to the wine. So, uh, yes, I, I, can, I can feel the minerality in, in Olmaya as well. Uh, Francesco, this, um, this vineyard was planted in 1984, is that correct? 
1984, the year of planting, yes. 1989, the first uh, harvest, the first vintage we bottled. So one thing I find very special about this, your father actually planted the vines in 1984 and unfortunately was never able to taste the fruits of his labor. And this is one of the you know, very compelling reasons why you continue on with this wine, aside from the obvious deliciousness of it, but it really is a tribute to your father and his pioneering spirit and everything that he put into Omaya. Yes, well, if you think of it, when, when he uh, settled here, when he purchased this estate, we're talking about the mid 70s, the early 70s, Montalcino was one of the poorest municipalities in Italy. I remember with my sister and my brother, we didn't want to come here. It took hours and hours of driving to, to reach this place because the roads were so, so bad and uh, nobody, nobody really knew where it was. And um, uh, so he, I never was, were, was able to ask him what did he see in Montalcino, but certainly uh, he, uh, he saw a bright future and he was, uh, he was right. And uh, um, planting the Cabernet Sauvignon, planting uh, different grape varieties was also, was also a tribute to his adventurous spirit and uh, uh, his foresight. Absolutely. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on before to we wrap up here is um, your partnership with the University of Florence goes back some time and you had re referred to the clonal research that you've done with them, but you also work together with the students at the university and give them some hands-on experience. Can you just talk for a minute about that um, partnership? Yes, well, we, we have a large collection of university theses uh, that have been conducted here. Um, more than 25, uh, the, the clonal selection, of course, the density of planting, uh, the uh, research on rootstocks, on the most suitable rootstocks for clay and for sandy soils and for the different conditions uh, here. Um, Moscatelli Montalcino clonal research. Um, uh, uh, management of the vineyards, so canopy management. Um, defoliations, uh, green harvest. Eventually, uh, and this is another example of how we uh, got, got to uh, organic and biodynamic eventually, we, we realized in the research of a green harvest, of uh, regulating the, uh, the amount of uh, grapes that uh, vineyard produced, that doing the green harvest was a mistake that if we had too much fruit at, uh, at, uh, on the plant at the time of, uh, of, the, uh, of the coloring of the grape, we had made mistakes before. We did not prune properly in winter. We had not cleaned the vineyard properly in, in early spring. Um, and that what brought us to realize that quality was the result of a balanced situation where not one where you push the plant to produce a lot and then you cut some of it down because it's, it's too much, uh, uh, too diluted. Uh, I don't know if I'm, if I explain myself. And this, this is the work we did with the University of Florence. This is the work we keep doing with the University of Florence. The clonal selection still goes on 30 years on. Uh, we planted four or five years ago, the ultimate 19 clones not only from our clonal selection, from Chianti selections, from uh, other producers in Tuscany uh, that have selected clones. Uh, and we, collect, we put them all together in, um, in one field, randomized, uh, and, uh, and now we're starting micro vinifications uh, to um, uh, uh, choose the winner, so to speak. Although we don't want only one winner because the Quality comes also from complexity, not just one individual. You have to have a, a variation of uh, characters to achieve a complexity and, and ultimately quality. Great, fantastic. Well, uh, one last question before we wrap up here. Michael Epstein's asking, um, when you took over the property from your father, did you expand the estate? Did you, did you um, plant more? in your early days? Yes, well, my father uh, <clears throat> arrived here and there was very little vineyard. Most of the vineyards were ancient. They, they were promiscuous uh, vineyards in fields uh, with rows of uh, olive trees and, uh, and um, 
vines uh, mixed together. So he started a more uh, modern kind of viticulture uh, with uh, dedicated fields only to, to vineyard. Uh, and uh, he managed to plant uh, about 70 hectares of, of vineyards during his time. And uh, now we're at 150. So I've expanded the, the production a fair amount. Fantastic, thank you. Well, we are just out of time. I don't wanna take anybody's uh, day away from them. So I'm going to say thank you very much, Count Francesco Moroni Cinzano. It was an absolute pleasure. And thank you to each and every one of you for joining us today. I'm very curious to hear what everybody's making for dinner tonight and uh, finishing off <laughs> these fabulous wines with. So please report back. And um, if you have any questions that we didn't get to answer here in the session today, we'll, um, we'll be back in touch and feel free to reach out to either myself uh, or Francesco for further information. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And enjoy thank you for the time. Thank you for this opportunity. Keep uh, safe, keep healthy. Hope to see you soon. Salute.